violent earthquake for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. What's your response to the Easter story today? The fact that Jesus is no longer dead, but the fact that he has risen from the grave. What is your response to the Easter story? For thousands of years, we've been retelling the story over and over again. And particularly on Easter Sunday and Good Friday, we actually unpack the story in more detail. We talk about on Friday the brutal death of Jesus upon the cross. And throughout the world today, followers like myself and others here this morning, will be declaring the fact that the stone has been rolled away, that Jesus has left the empty tomb, that he is alive and living and dwelling amongst us today through the power of his spirit. So today the question is, what is your response to the Easter story? Let me pray. Father God, this morning as we ask that question of ourselves, as we look at the scriptures and hear more from your word, I pray that we'd all just be open to answer that question. Lord, for some of us, we're followers of Jesus already, and Lord, there's a different response that's required. But Lord, for some who are maybe online or even here today who've never really grasped what it actually means, Lord, I pray that you would just speak into our spirit this morning, that you would bring that change and that insight and that answer that we need, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. As with today, news travels fast. The event that took place over 2,000 years ago with Jesus' death um, upon the cross and then uh, the the fact that the tomb was empty and uh, we know that his believers claimed, as we do, that he rose from the dead, but there were many who questioned that. But there was many conversations happening at the time. Not only was it about Jesus of Nazareth and what happened on the cross and and later what happened three days later, but they would have been talking about the earthquake that took place that broke a whole lot of different things. They would have even been talking, the Pharisees in particular and the teachers of the law and the priests would have been talking about the fact that the temple of the Holy of Holies, the curtain that was separating the Holy and Holies was ripped. And now they, they had to put a makeshift up so they could actually protect the Holy of Holies. There would have been a whole lot of conversation about what took place in the Holy of Holies where where it basically now has been accessible to everyone. Many also would have been hearing of the official announcement from the government at the time that, in fact, Jesus didn't rise from the dead. In fact, it was his followers that stole his body. So there would have been a whole lot of talk around what was actually going on. We read this in Matthew chapter 28. As the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priests what had happened. In other words, the tomb was empty. A meeting with the elders was called and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. Isn't this amazing? They told the soldiers, you must say Jesus' disciple came during the night while we were sleeping and they stole his body. If the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said what they were told to say. Their story spread widely among the Jews and is still told and is still told today. Can you believe it that they actually decided to bribe the soldiers instead of actually questioning what really was going on? They were so adamant that Jesus was not the Messiah that they were willing to break their own code of ethics and their own morals, everything, to try and keep him silent. What happened to Jesus would have been talked about in the town and the fact that he rose from the dead or stolen, depending on where you sat on the fence, would have been discussed in their homes, in the marketplace, in the temples. And I want to suggest that similar to today, it would have been online, it would have been on TV, the newspapers, headline. This would have been the leading news for, for many days. What happened to Jesus? Did he rise from the dead? Or do we accept the fact that the government is telling us that his body was stolen? I can imagine many at the time who were following Jesus wanted desperately to believe that he was alive, but it just didn't make sense. How how could this really be? 
it's a logic decision to actually say that he, his body was stolen. That, that makes sense. I, I, I can understand that. And we can imagine the battle that people had to actually accept that this man had rose from the dead, similar today. Many people struggle with the concept of Jesus rising from the dead. It makes more sense to say that his body was stolen. But many who had witnessed Jesus' miracles, especially even the raising of Lazarus from the dead himself, were obviously more open to the fact that he could have actually rose from the dead. But it's his disciples that spent time with Jesus that got to see the first hand the physical presence of Jesus after his resurrection. They got to sit with him. They got to eat with him, drink with him, spend time with him. And the Bible tells us that for about 40 days, Jesus appeared and reappeared with the disciples and his followers for a period of 40 days. We read this in Scripture. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. He talked to them about the kingdom of God. In the 40 days that Jesus physically walked the earth after his resurrection, he spent time teaching and instructing his followers. And we know from Scripture there was two key things that Jesus did in those 40 days. One was he shared the Great Commission, which we know from Matthew 28. We read these words, And the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some still doubted. So even, even still seeing Jesus, some still doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of age. This has been the driving force for myself, uh, for many Christians in the world today. It's the whole reason the church exists is to help people connect with Jesus, to tell them about Jesus to baptise people and to teach them all the things that Jesus taught us. And the second thing that Jesus spoke about was not just the Great Commission and, and commissioning his disciples, but he also told them about the Holy Spirit and gave them instructions about what to do when he departs and ascended into heaven. Once they were eating with them and he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You see, before Jesus went to the cross, he'd already been speaking to his followers about the Holy Spirit. And if we're really honest about this, they just didn't get it. They knew the concept of what Jesus was talking about, but they had no idea what this Holy Spirit, what this counselor, what this teacher was going to be. We read it in John chapter 14 where Jesus says, and this is before he died and, and on the cross and he's been hanging with his disciples for a while. He says, and I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another advocate who will speak, who, who will never leave you. Here's the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I am raised to life again, you'll know that I am in the Father. I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. You can imagine the disciples going, yeah, okay, that's nice, Jesus. Let's move on. <laughs> they didn't really get it. But at this point, in the 40 days of hanging with Jesus after his resurrection, suddenly some of this stuff started making sense. And then Jesus is saying to them, don't leave until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And they were instructed what to do. 
And after seeing the resurrection of Jesus and spending time with him, they now knew what was really going on. And in the Bible reading today, we read of the Apostle Peter, who's the same Peter who denied Jesus three times, who basically was fearful of what everyone was doing and the, the fact that he himself could have been arrested and killed. And he was scared and he was fearful of what could happen to him. Now he's standing up in front of people boldly proclaiming the truth about Jesus and the fact that he is alive. We read in the scripture in Acts chapter 2. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles. So they're all with him. They haven't scattered. They haven't fled. This is the power of God's spirit at work. Then he stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, so this is just after the Holy Spirit come upon them and they're all speaking in different languages and they thought they were possibly drunk. But he says, these people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is so too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. And this is out of Joel chapter 2. He says, in the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I'll pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heaven as above and signs on earth below. Blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn to blood red before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The interesting thing about this is a lot of people would have known about the prophecy from the prophet Joel. And what Peter was retelling them is stuff that they would have already knew about. And what he's saying is that this Jesus that you've just been hearing about and many would have seen even being crucified, he is the one that the prophet Joel is talking about, that the Holy Spirit will be coming upon us because of his death and resurrection. In Acts chapter 2, it goes on to say, People of Israel, listen, God, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus of Nazareth by doing powerful miracles, wonders and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew that what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of lawless Gentiles. You nailed him to the cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep its grip. See, everyone knew of Jesus. Everyone knew of the person of Jesus. They also knew of the many miracles and the signs and wonders that he had done. That's why when he came in Jerusalem, the crowd were going nuts. They were celebrating who Jesus was. But then when the government got involved and the political stuff started happening, everyone started separating because they were all now fearful of their own lives. But they saw and heard the stories of Jesus healing sick people, healing the blind people, healing the lame people, casting out demons, feeding over 5,000 plus people, raising people. They heard the stories. And what Peter is saying is Jesus was accredited by God, that the reason that he did this is because it was God that did it. And it was clear that this is the hand of God at work. And he goes on to declare to the crowds more of stuff that they would have already known. And he talks about King David and what King David had said about the coming Messiah. And again, I remind you that people back then would have understood exactly what Peter was saying. He said in Acts chapter 2, he goes on to say, King David said this about him. This is about Jesus. And this is taken out of Psalm, Psalm 16. I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad and my tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. He goes on to say, you have shown me the way of life and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. They would have heard that. They would have known that. And here is Peter joining the dots and he says, dear brothers, Think about this. In other words, think about this. I'm joining the dots here for you. 
You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and he was buried and his tomb is still amongst us. In other words, it's a physical tomb for King David. This is not himself he was talking about. But he was a prophet and he knew God and had promised with an oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. And I can imagine at this point, as Peter is speaking these words, a whole bunch of people are starting to go, oh, my goodness me, it's starting to make sense now. The dots are starting to connect. He's given a brief history lesson to the people at the time. And he's talking about the fact that the person that Joel was talking about, the person that King David is talking about, is actually Jesus Christ, and he's putting it together. He's the Messiah, and he is not dead, but in fact, he is alive. God raised this Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses to that. We're declaring to you that Jesus is alive. We've seen him with our own eyes. They were first-hand witnesses. And I want to suggest today, that even as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, there are still many people who question, how could this be? Even his followers, even those who saw him physically, still questioned, how could this be? We read the book of Mark, and Mark tells us this, that after Jesus rose from the dead early on the Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene, the woman from whom he had cast out the seven demons. Interestingly, when the women saw Jesus, they didn't didn't question it at all. It was the men that had problems. Anyway, well, let's not go there. She went to the disciples who were grieved and weeping, and he told them what had happened. But when she told them that Jesus was alive and that she'd seen him, they didn't believe her. Even Jesus' own disciples questioned, how could this be? Even after being with him, even after seeing the stuff that he was doing in a miraculous sense, And again, John tells us one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. And many know this, the Doubting Thomas story. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them and place my hand in the wounds in his side. I just can't comprehend this. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Just Even that just blows my mind, that Jesus just appeared. And he says, peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into my wound and put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And his response is simply, my Lord and my God. And he says then, Jesus told him, you believe because you've seen me. But blessed are those who believe without seeing me. You know, that's that's about us. Blessed are us because we believe without actually seeing the physical Jesus like the disciples did. Even though a number of Jesus' disciples questioned even and, and, and wrestled with his resurrection, they couldn't comprehend it. But what we know is that once they saw him and interacted with him, something dramatically changed. They went from being fearful and worried about their own future to suddenly being bold and proclaiming the name of Jesus wherever they went. The Holy Spirit's presence within their life brought the change. When they saw Jesus after his resurrection and received the promised Holy Spirit, they went from fear to mighty proclaimers of Jesus, being alive and being Lord. Now, it's interesting that Peter would have most likely had seen every aspect of Jesus' trial and arrest. He would have seen the arrest. He was there. The trial, he was there in the background. He probably would have seen the beatings and even would have been there when they sentenced him to be crucified. And I would suggest that Peter most likely would have been somewhere in the vicinity as as Jesus walked along carrying the cross up to Golgotha. And he may have even been watching when Jesus was crucified and eventually died 
And he may have even been there when they buried him. And he certainly was there when they when he was resurrected. And he was certainly there when he ascended. You see, this is the same Peter who was fearful and denied Jesus even was his mate. And then in those 40 days somewhere, Jesus hung out with Peter and said these simple words, hey, Peter, do you love me? You know I do, Jesus. He says again, do you love me? Come on, Jesus, you know I do. Third time after three denials, do you love me, Jesus? Do you love me, Peter? And he says, yes, Jesus. And he then says, feed my sheep. Reinstates Peter, empowers Peter, and yet we see now him standing amongst the crowds, boldly declaring without fear of his own well-being and his own life because he knows that Jesus is alive and Jesus is with him. And it's as if Jesus was standing right next to him because he was through the power of his spirit. That the boldness that he had was transformed. That when he got up, he was able to say, God raised this Jesus from the dead and we're all witness to this. Now he's exalted to the place of the highest honour in heaven and God's right hand and the Father, as he has promised, has gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us just as you see and hear today. In other words, what you're experiencing, folks, is the power of God's Holy Spirit's presence amongst his followers. You're seeing this first hand. You see, Jesus, when he was physically walking the earth, could only be in one place at one time. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, he was with all his disciples all at once, just like he's with us now. If you're a follower of Jesus, then the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And it's as like Jesus is standing right next to you. And he calls you to be his hands, feet, and voice. That's how Peter could boldly stand up and start letting the crowds have it. So he let everyone know for certain that God had made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And Peter's words pierced their hearts and they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, each one of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and to those who are far away, all those who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging the listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And those who believed what Peter said were baptised and they added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. I want to suggest this morning if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, there is no way in the world that Peter would stand and speak like that. I want to suggest that the other disciples would not have stood with Peter side by side. They would have fled because they still would have been fearful of their own life. And yet because of the power of God's spirit upon them, they have now standing boldly preaching the name of Jesus connecting the dots of what this story is all about. And 3,000 people in all were added to the church that day. 3,000 people surrendered their lives and said, yes, we believe what you're saying, Peter. We believe that Jesus is the Messiah. This Jesus that many of them would have seen with their own eyes is the one that the prophets have talked about. And we want to surrender our lives to him. We are going to repent and we're going to be baptised in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. My question this morning is, what is your response to the Easter story today? If you're a follower of Jesus, I trust that you've been reminded of the fact that God is standing next to you through the power of his spirit. That he's called you to be his hands and feet and voice to this city and beyond. And that wherever you go, his spirit is present. Just like Peter had the boldness to stand up and preach, he's giving you the same boldness in yourself. Don't be silent. Don't be quiet. You are God's hands, feet and voice. And his Holy Spirit's presence is with you 24-7. And he's asking you to be his hands, feet and voice in the spheres of influence that you have in this city. But maybe this morning you're not a follower of Jesus. 
And maybe today you're hearing the story for the first time and trying to put it all together. My question is, do you accept that Jesus is alive or not? Now, if you accept that he's been stolen and he's not alive and that's that's fine, then you don't have to worry about anything. But if you actually say, yes, I actually do believe that Jesus rose from the dead, then there's a response that is required from that. You see, Jesus, we talk about him not only at Easter time and Christmas as a nation, we base our public holidays around the birth and death and resurrection of Jesus. And I've said it many a times, even people who aren't followers of Jesus are happy to have Good Friday off, are happy to have Easter Sunday off, even happy to have Easter Monday. Our nation is built around the truth of Jesus' death and resurrection. Our calendar is built around Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus was accredited to you by the words I've just spoken in the Bible and the testimonies and the the, the stories from generation to generation. Here in this room are stories after stories of Jesus being at work in our lives. And these have been accredited to you. And the whole thing of um, Faith Runs Deep and, and the Unearth event is people telling their stories of what God has done in their life. You can't argue with a story. You can say it's not true, but that's my experience. This is what I know is true. There is power in a testimony. You see, Jesus lived a perfect life. He didn't do anything wrong. And all he did was wanted to help people connect with the Father. He was falsely accused, falsely arrested. He was beaten. He was nailed to a cross and he was left to die. But this was God's plan for salvation, that Jesus would give up his life so that you yourself would have life, that Jesus would die upon the cross so that we would have our sins forgiven. John 3.16, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. Folks, Jesus is alive today and we are witnesses of the fact through testimony, through the scriptures, through the experience of God at work in our own lives. God raised Jesus from the dead. And we are all witnesses of that fact. He's exalted to the right hand of God. He's received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and he's poured it out and that's what you see in here now. That's the power of the church. Is God's Spirit has been poured out upon the Christ followers. And the things that we do are not just in our own abilities, but they're in the name of Jesus. God, who made this world, May Jesus also both Lord and Saviour of this world. As we close this morning, we're going to have an opportunity of sharing in communion. And what this communion represents is the story I've just talked about. That we actually celebrate this every Sunday to remind ourselves that Jesus not only died, but he rose again from the grave that he's alive and he's active and he's at work in and through all of us who call Jesus Lord and Saviour. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, before he went to the cross, he hung out with his disciples and had what is known as the Last Supper, his last meal. And in the midst of that, they're eating and drinking and celebrating. He got up and he took a bit of the bread and he said, guys, I want you to stop for a moment and listen. This bread represents my body that is given to you. I want you to take the bread and I want you to eat it. And when you do, I want you to remember me. Remember all that I've said. Remember all that I've done. Remember me. And likewise, he took the cup and he said, I want you to drink this. This is representing my blood that was actually shed upon the cross. And when you take this, I want you to remember me. And as we sit on this side of the cross, as we take this, we actually don't just remember the fact that Jesus walked and lived this earth and everything we read in Scripture, 
But we, we, we witness the fact that Jesus is alive and with us today. And as the word of God says, every time we take the bread and the cup, we're proclaiming that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is Lord and Savior, and one day he is going to return. So every time we share in communion, we're proclaiming Jesus' death and resurrection and that he loves you and I so much that he allowed himself to go through that so that we would have life and have it to the full. So what's your response to the Easter story today? As we share in this time of communion, I want to encourage you to reflect upon all that we've been speaking and encourage you to wrestle with your memories of what it is that you want God to be doing in your life today. Let's uh, stand again. Let's um, have the communion help us to come forward and let's share in communion. Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If this morning your response to this story is, What are we going to do? Or what should I do? Then this is your answer. God calls us to repent of our sins, the wrongdoing the stuff that we've been doing wrong, to turn away from that and to turn to God and to accept Jesus as our Lord, as our Saviour, be baptised and live for him. You know, when you actually accept Jesus as our Lord, you're actually saying your life's under new management. That there's someone else in control, not yourself. My prayer this morning is that if any of these words have rung true to you, that you would repent be baptised and become a follower of Jesus and be under new management. Well, Father God, we thank you for this morning. And, Lord, I pray that as we uh, conclude our service in just a moment, that you would help us to continue to wrestle with our response to the Easter story. For some of us, Lord, we need to step up and be bold like Peter, to continue to be your hands and feet and voice to the city. For others, we need to acknowledge that you are risen that you're alive and active today and that we need to repent of our sins and turn to you, be baptised in the name of Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to respond appropriately this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close by singing a, a beautiful song, Lord, I Give You My Heart. And it's one that, for me, you can't sing unless you mean it. And uh, I just want to encourage you as we, we sing it, reflect upon the words that we sing. And if you want to talk more about what I've said today, um, then come down and talk to me at the front. Uh, for those on the phone and computers, give us a call through the week. Um, but my prayer is that we would all give our hearts to Jesus um, and we'll be sold out to him 24-7. Let's stand together and let's sing. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath I take, every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. Father God, as we close our Easter service today, that's my prayer for not only myself, but I pray that for all of us and for those watching online, Lord, that there'd be a sense where we would surrender everything to you and that would be our response to Easter this year, to acknowledge your lordship, to acknowledge that you have risen from the grave, to acknowledge your Holy Spirit's presence in our life. But, Lord, also to acknowledge our sinfulness and our need of a saviour. So, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings you give to us every day and the fact that you're always with us 24-7. Father, as we go from here, may we go in boldness and in power, knowing that your spirit is with us. And I pray you watch over and protect us until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for being with us this morning and I encourage you to stay and have a hot cross bun. For those on the phone, we're going to end very shortly too. God bless.